Are you sitting there right now using a PC with an overpriced operating system while you eat unhealthy ramen? Well, I apparently have all of the solutions to your life. Go to Vite Ramen right now and get their healthy protein-filled ramen for 10% off with offer code BROKENSILICON. And then go to cdkeyoffer.com to get 25% off all Windows keys and use Die Shrink to get 3% off everything else on the website. And we'll talk about these sponsors more later. But for now, let's just get on with the show. And welcome to Broken Silicon, a gaming hardware podcast. I am your host, Tom, and today I am joined by my co-host, Dan. How's it going, Dan? Pretty good. How are you doing? Good. I mean, I don't know what it's like up there in Minnesota, but my Lord, down here in uh, Nashville, it's just been beautiful outside for the past few days. Well, uh, despite a warm, uh, a pretty warm winter, it has snowed about six inches uh, in the past day, so that's fun. Nope, can't say that. No clouds in the sky, 60 to 70 degrees and sunny. Um, this is why I moved here. And right now it looks like what you would expect it to look like on uh, Christmas. <laughs> yes, maybe here. Uh, past couple of years, yeah, that's actually how it has looked here. Um, we've gotten snow. I actually had a friend visit uh, from Portland, Oregon, and it was funny. Uh, he, he absolutely loved visiting here. Uh, and he, so this isn't anything like I expected and he couldn't believe how many license plates he was seeing, not from Tennessee. Like there's one parking lot we were walking around in and it was just like Illinois, New York, Maryland, several Ontarios in one parking lot, which is interesting. I'm not sure what those Canadians are up to down here. I don't really trust them, but yeah, I thought you were going to bring up the, uh, he saw the Dolly Parton license plate at first because that was. I actually don't know that I saw a single Dolly yeah. Parton license plate this weekend, which is surprising. That was the funniest thing to me is uh, when I first saw a, Do- a Dolly Parton license plate because the second God in Tennessee is uh, Dolly Parton. Oh yeah. She <laughs> is worshiped here as a deity for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's It's a great kind of. He was going to visit in like a month or two and then said, or it could be this weekend. And I went, oh, and as we'll get to, I actually put out my video on a Wednesday and I'm free all Friday. And then he's like, well, remember, I'd be traveling in the morning and early afternoon. So I'd probably wouldn't matter. And I went, no, Lou, on work days, I work till midnight half the time. So it matters actually now. And (laughs) he ended up coming down and is. Probably couldn't have picked a better weekend, actually. I think I could have used I could use this too. It's a good kind of mini vacation. Yeah, that's nice. And I know you also haven't seen him in a while. So no, no, Lou. I it, it's been honestly, it's so bizarre. I mean, obviously we've talked since I've last seen him. It's been years. I don't, I don't even know how that happens, but I guess it just does um once you get to this age. Although I will say at this point, a couple years kind of to me feels almost like half a year did five yeah, to ten I years know. ago. It's I think me and you were talking about that the other night. I don't remember what it was in regards to, but it was something like, no, didn't that happen like a couple months ago? And I'm like, no, Dan, that was eight months ago. Just now it feels like eight months because of how old we're getting. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Everything has been a whirlwind since 2020. So <laughs> and it's it still just doesn't feel like it stopped. But Good times, I guess. Uh, oh, I mean, things since 2020 have only gotten easier and less insane for sure. And the good news is, I bet that trend continues. All right. <laughs> Speaking well, of the passage of time. Let me pass time by getting to the first reader mail. Falto <laughs> writes in and says, hopefully I'm not too late, but happy episode 250 for Broken Silicon. Yeah, I didn't even realize or I don't put much thought into it. I mean, half the time our, our milestone will probably be 256 or something. And, and it's every 52 as well as yearly anniversaries. So a lot of places might celebrate like a round number like 50, but nope, we want to go in multiples of like 64. Or the yearly anniversary. So it it is crazy so, to believe, though, that we're almost to 256. Or we can wait another four weeks and just celebrate the five-year anniversary at 5, 6, 260. 
Which is yeah, which is what is what we'll do. Um, and I probably won't remember it's the anniversary episode until like 30 minutes before we start. And then I'll try to find some way to acknowledge it. But I don't know. That's just it's just so funny. Anytime there's like, oh, that's right, it's a yearly anniversary, or we're almost to, about to hit Broken Silicon 200 or something. I'm just not thinking about milestones because I'm just so focused on just the next thing we've got to get done. Well, on the f- uh, fifth anniversary of this podcast, you can just faintly play uh, the happy birthday song in the background the entire episode. Yeah, and I'll have flashing LED lights <laughs> everywhere. I did do that, remember, at the end of one of them, just to be annoying. Um, I'm sure no one would have complained about that. Um, but that's the only opening reader mail I actually have for this episode, which remember, you can submit if you support us on Patreon and uh, go head to head with trying to prevent QH Freddy from being half of the questions in some episodes if you want to. But uh, otherwise, yeah, let's get on with it with story number one. NVIDIA Blackwell announced at GTC, quoting here from Guru 3D, B200 was just announced and it is NVIDIA's largest chip made possible by existing foundry technology, featuring an impressive 208 billion transistors across two chiplets, each with 104 billion transistors. These chiplets fabricated on TSMC's N4P node, the most advanced 4 nanometer class technology, are interconnected by a 10 terabyte per second custom link to ensure cache coherency. B200 comes equipped with 192 gigabytes of HBM3E memory distributed across Eight 24 gigabyte stacks and provides a total, yeah, eight gigabyte terabytes per second of memory bandwidth. With Blackwell, NVIDIA continues the trend of doubling down on low precision training, now pushing an FP4 format, uh, which is effectively a logarithmic format and one that is debatably proven yet. Another trend Blackwell continues is that of NVIDIA as a systems provider, going from GGX systems now to complex boards or super chips. And another another continuation is the complete reuse of Grace. No, no updates at all, Dan. Um, I lost where I was. As the CPU portion of the super chip, cementing Grace's position as a glorified memory expander. Last, Blackwell seems to completely abandon any pretensions to HPC compute. This will likely make the chip all but abandoned by the supercomputed world. So anyways, there to Blackwell is already emerging in the zeitgeist as one of NVIDIA's enduring triumph over AMD, considering MI300X hasn't really been fully launched according to this channel's sources. I actually spoke with one of my sources today, Dan, by the way, and to this day, MI300 is very hard to get. People don't even think they've shipped 20,000 or maybe they have there by now, but it's really not in high volume yet like one would argue that relative to how you would typically expect out of a launch that we're we're, it's as if the chip is launching now is the way people are telling me um we're amd to have fully launched mi300x in volume in the middle of 2023 one could have simply argued that mi300 launches launched a little after hopper arguably in between hopper and blackwell and therefore it's okay because it's in between those two levels of performance. However, as it currently stands, it feels like AMD is letting the narrative get away from them to NVIDIA's gigantic benefit as MI300 starts to feel like more of a Blackwell competitor than a Hopper competitor. Um, yeah, so Dan, what do you think about this? Uh, I mean, I think the most impressive part about if this works well is the fact that they you know, have their, their tiled approach now with... Uh, Blackwell, because based on my where I'm coming from, it looks like that's where the majority of their gains are coming from. Is just that they're a ton doubling, of silicon. Yeah, is they're doubling the silicon because I broke it down and uh, per Blackwell uh, per silicon basis. So if you're just looking at one of the tiles, I think it's only about 25 percent faster in compute than uh, uh, Hopper. And if you're looking at FP8 and FP16, which is what I thought was interesting that they're doubling down on FP4 because I got on a little bit of a uh, uh, rabbit hole to see what FP4 was and how useful it is. And it seems that there are only a few papers, a few is probably underselling it, but it doesn't seem like there are even that many academic papers about FP4 at this point for machine learning. So Mm. I'm curious if this FP4 is more just them trying to hot, make it look like there's still uh, exponential growth when there really isn't. Oh, there's definitely and, some of that there. Yeah. <laughs> and if this is still largely just going to be using FP8 and FP16. Yeah, you know, the way I would, because I think most people are in the this is impressive camp when it comes to Blackwell right now. Mm-hmm. But the way 
And I've seen some people argue it's actually not remotely as impressive as they're making it out. But the, the way I would frame it is the major thing with how Blackwell's is impressive versus what AMD is doing right now is that it seems like MI300 is not that widely available yet. Mm-hmm. And we'll get to in the next story, they, they're they seemingly moving to a yearly cadence. And from that perspective, this is a huge issue for AMD, right? Oh, I That is see what that. makes this the problem. It's not like anything here is, it's almost like when we've talked about Apple, it's like, yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah, it's also really expensive and uses a ton of silicon. It's not surprising, it's powerful when they over double the amount of silicon that they're <laughs> using here. Um, so I think it all really does come down to if, Emma, if AMD... And I, I, I hear, and I th- I've seen, I think it was semi-analysis said this too, that MI350X is being canceled because it just wouldn't be competitive with Blackwell. And they're trying to accelerate MI400X. All right, well, AMD, MI400X, in my opinion, needs to come out at the end of this year. And MI300 this summer better finally have high volume so that you have that like six-month period where it's actually the thing to buy. Because otherwise, it just kind of feels like a- NVIDIA is going to spend their way towards making sure AMD always feels like a generation behind. Yeah, because I would say the the other big thing that they were advertising with this, which they used wishy-washy language, so you don't know exactly what it means, but like 25x efficiency or something like that. So oh, who knows? They're, they're touting some pretty big efficiency gains. I'm sure there's some like fudged math so they can get as big of a number as they can. But if you're putting something out like that, you would think that they're going to be saving there would be a lot of energy savings. So, I mean, I guess doubling the number of tiles uh, on a di- on a die might help increase efficiency because you need to can have more tiles in a single uh, server. But you know, and here's another thing too. I actually disputes probably the wrong word, but I have a bit of an issue with how some people are characterizing it. Like I've seen so many people just go, "Nvidia finally enters the chiplet era." Have they? I mean, no, they haven't, guys. Come on, what is this? I mean, this is not the same thing as what AMD is doing. Um, This is, they just spent all this money on basically mating two chips to be bigger than, you know, the ridicule limit. That's, I mean, Jensen himself goes on stage and says, no, like one part of the Blackwell overall die does not know which side it's on there's nothing here being programmed for the fact that this is chiplet based this really isn't a chiplet architecture this is a bigger than reticle limit architecture Mm -hmm. anything though all of the reasons you would be using chiplets the way amd is it's not it's not really the same thing it's We'll, we'll see what happens with other products that they can make with this i'll probably get to that in some videos coming up in a few weeks but like i I don't know that I would completely say NVIDIA's entered the chiplet era with this, like, right? Yeah, I mean, it just sounds like they got their interconnects working a lot better. Because I can't remember exactly what it was, but apparently on a hopper, a, a design like this probably just wouldn't have worked. So they put a lot of work into getting mm-hmm. interconnects to work, which were needed. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, it's a step in that direction, and I'm sure they're the next generation of uh, GPUs, maybe it won't be in consumer GPUs, but their next generation of GPUs are one after that. I'm sure we'll start getting more complex than what this is. Or the packaging will start getting more complex. I'm not, I'm not saying this isn't a complex architecture or anything. But again, I guess going greater than reticle size is one of the benefits of chiplets. Mm-hmm. But the other two are the economics of being able to use a bunch of smaller chiplets better yields to you know not waste as much on disabling parts of the silicon they're not getting that benefit here and the other one is that amd can literally use the same cpu chiplet from apus to desktop cpus to various forms of data center chips and that's can they uh, you know use maybe one of these with some other maybe but it's really not the same mixing and matching they're really only getting a third of the benefits you know they're not getting the economics benefit they're not getting the mixing and matching benefit they're mm-hmm. just getting the greater than reticle limit benefit so yeah again like is this a chiplet architecture they can argue it is but i i i, I i'm not seeing this like oh amd's doesn't have its own tricks up its sleeve right now. This is just NVIDIA doing what they always do. Bigger and more expensive, right? 
Yeah, which I mean, they command the space uh, right now, and so. people, companies are buying these things up as fast as they can get them. So I'm sure they can sell this for the thirty to forty th- grand that they say they want to sell it for. <laughs> right, and you know that's something that. I think we're going to have to discuss more and more. I think we touched on it actually in the latest uh, die shrink. But like the one question I have though is let's say Blackwell is 50% to 100% better than MI 300X or something, right? And Mm -hmm. like the actual workloads most people use, not FB4. And okay. All right. But if it costs twice as much, would you pay that? Yeah. You'd pay twice as much for double the performance for a simpler stack. And using NVIDIA software and proven reliability and like being able to deliver products. Maybe, maybe you would pay twice as much for twice the performance. Three times as much uh for double the performance. Hmm. I don't know. Probably four times. I don't think so. So that's the question: is where does this actually get priced? Is it priced so much higher than MI 300 x that actually it's not that impressive? And how does that change with like Ruben versus? MI 400X, you know, um, which to answer that question, though, I do want to also point out one more thing that I really did note in NVIDIA's GTC presentation was how much focus NVIDIA was doing on the ability to swap out blades and put in new ones and swap out parts, basically telegraphing. Yeah, maybe you're paying more for us, but you know what? We are delivering generations faster than AMD and they're easier to upgrade between. So that's another big thing they're telegraphing there. Oh, yeah, which I'm sure a bunch of, <laughs> I'm sure NVIDIA is excited to sell these companies their updated <laughs> uh, blades every uh, year if they can do that. Yeah. Jesus, um, that's a lot of silicon. Amyville Chief writes in and says, For all the talk about crypto driven power consumption in the recent past, no one seems to be talking all that much about the present day AI driven power consumption. Do you feel that because AI doesn't consume nearly as much power as crypto, because power consumption is secondary to AI-driven profits, perceived future value, that people are finally moving past power consumption as a meaningful metric for bleeding-edge technological advancements? Huh. It was really two interesting things you're touching on here. I, I, I'm not going to get into the weeds about the crypto comparison, really, except that to point out that, so far, what are we using AI for that like, for example, I had um, oh god, I'm blanking on his name, but I had someone on recently who does work um with like analyzing things in nature from the sky with cameras, and then they use a small cluster of like five thirty nineties to look through the pictures instead of interns looking and circling things. Well, that's a good use for AI. It's not using that much energy, though. So that's not really what we're talking about. What about these companies that have, like, thousands of GPUs, waste, some might argue, wasting energy to train things that aren't really being used for useful stuff yet? Why is nobody complaining about that? I don't know. Uh, I mean, why? where's the articles about the energy of Norway being used? And if, I think it's too soon to say it's the same, but if at the end of five years we have no useful apps using half of this stuff, I think it's time to start asking those questions, though. Well, I, I eh, there is a Verge article. Um, oh, they say by 2027, they think the AI sector will be using as much energy as the Netherlands, which... Wait, I don't measure things in terms of Netherlands, so I don't really the, know what that the, means. The, but but I, I, the biggest thing I have seen is like Sam Altman, I can't remember what he said, but it, he, he was like... He, wa- he wants Fusion to take off because then he could use as much energy as he wanted for AI. He's like, well, I could use seven Fusion reactors for AI. And everyone was like, shut up, Sam Altman. We don't care. <laughs> but So there has been some of that. But I don't know. I mean, I, I just think there's a knee-jerk dislike of uh, cryptocurrency by a lot of people. And I do think a lot of it is really stupid, to be fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> that I think people just find anything to critique about it before they really even think about what they're saying. and. With this, we're now we're now in the cycle of skepticism about AI. Whereas a year ago, I think we were I th- a year ago. I think more people were excited about AI, like talking about all of the, its advancements, without really talking about how useful those advancements really are. Like, look at ChatGPT can write this code for me, and it's it's full of errors. But don't tell anyone that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I think we're in the now in this phase of skepticism. Uh where people are going to start getting pissed off when they see anything using AI. Like, 
there's now a big controversy that in new indie movie that came out used like two AI generated images and people are like, I'm going to boycott this movie over it. And it's okay. But <laughs> yeah, but yes, yeah, that's also the other side of the like, stupid. Like, Oh, don't get overly mad. Now, on. now, now we might be getting into the stupid criticisms of AI or that's where I think it's going to go for in the next six months. Yeah. And as for his other question where he says, are people finally moving past power consumption as a meaningful metric in some ways, I kind of think so. Like, it feels like everyone was obsessed with efficiency, especially about five years ago. There seems to be something here where they're like, hey, we accept we're going to make bigger computers now because Moore's Law is dead. And uh, whoever has the biggest computer can make the most money the fastest. So let's not talk about efficiency. Like, there's uh, some yeah. of that. Yeah, there's some of that. Hopefully, the, your, these uh, computers are being attached to uh, decent energy sources, I guess. But yeah. Uh, Cole Addict writes him, how quickly will Disney sue NVIDIA when Groot gets asked for its name? Yeah, I saw that they named one of their code, their AI things announced as Groot or GR00T, I think, or something. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, is Disney going to be okay with that? (laughs) What happens when the the most litigious company in the world goes after the most rich company in the world? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, that'll be a real Batman showdown, I suppose. All right. Well, let's continue the NVIDIA conversation now with story number two. NVIDIA Vera Rubin apparently preparing for launch less than a year after B200. In a recent video out of this channel, the following was quoted by a source at NVIDIA. This person said to me, we don't think AMD will have MI400X ready until Q1 2025 at the earliest. And that means it will end up competing with Rubin. Yep. Vera Rubin is launching mid-2025, and we're hoping to get it out earlier than that, if possible. Lately, AMD has sought to launch their data center products in between NVIDIA's launches. This led to success with MI100, MI250X, and at least in terms of demand, not necessarily supply so far, according to my sources. Now, MI300X raising AMD's profile and pushing them closer to NVIDIA, expanding their user base. But a lot of this has arguably depended on NVIDIA's cadence. With Vera Rubin, NVIDIA is looking to cut short their generations from two years to one. And with that, they are closing AMD's window to launch with an advantage against NVIDIA's older design. AMD will thus have to compete directly and no time with no time advantage unless AMD can get MI400X out in under a year from now, the surprising NVIDIA back. And that's why I keep talking about how important that will be for them to try and do that. But you know, I'll also point this out, everybody. I was told originally Blackwell was three nanometer. In fact, I have schematics where it was. So um, at least this version of Blackwell mm-hmm. was three nanometer until uh, somewhat recently. So I think it's worth pointing out GB 200 isn't launching this month. And I just think in the past six months, the decision was made to go with N four P over N three to make sure it can come out as soon as possible. Efficiency be damned. And I was directly told by someone at NVIDIA over the past week, by the way, everybody that Blackwell, the point of it, GB 200 it recently became all about launching as soon as possible, and they cut some corners to get mm-hmm. there. And that's why, Dan, if you look at it, it just seems like they're using a ton of silicon. Yeah, it's because apparently they're dumping all of their money into getting Vera Rubin out half a year to a year sooner than initially planned. And then they're accelerating Blackwell to be a stopgap in between those launches. And yeah, Rubin yeah. is supposedly yeah. coming out, I'd say... If not in quarter two next year, early quarter three, and there's a chance it could launch quarter one. I mean, yeah, AMD is going to have a hard time at least competing in AI uh, if Vera Rubin comes out that soon. <laughs> I, I don't really know what else to add to that. I mean, it seems like a- NVIDIA is going more and more for the AI market, so maybe there's a niche uh, in other data centers uh, for the MI300 or MI400 whenever that comes out. But Mm -hmm. yeah, that's not a good thing if AMD, if uh, NVIDIA can double their release cadence because I are even just 50% increase their release cadence because I don't think NVIDIA has, I mean, Jesus, I'm getting my companies mixed up constantly. I don't think AMD has the resources to keep up with that cadence and do everything else they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in fact, the biggest thing NVIDIA should worry about being exposed to with this is when the AI bubble pops, because it will pop at some point. And again, that doesn't mean it's useless. That doesn't mean that a year ago it was overvalued. But if the bubble keeps expanding, it will just inevitably be over 
valued. If NVIDIA has dumped all of their money into launching like three AI releases in three years and neglected their gaming base and then that pops, I don't know. That's something to think about here. And I, I do think it's something AMD and everyone else should be thinking about too is you better get on board with competing in AI, but try to make sure your other segments aren't being completely neglected because there may be an opportunity if that bubble pops to just go for the kill in another market that isn't collapsing as much. Yeah, and that's the only other thing I can wonder is if they're, is if they're being overly ambitious because they're trying to get all the money they've sunk into these GPUs out and get them out before that bubble pops. That's what I'm guessing too, is that they're like, ooh, we think this bubble is going to pop in 26. We better hammer it hard first half of 25. And then maybe the follow-up to Ruben is a gaming architecture like Maxwell that just goes for it in gaming. Yeah, and then maybe the follow-up... AI architecture, they slow down again on their release cadence and move back to every two years because Mm. we keep talking about the market popping, but that doesn't mean AI is going to go away. There's still probably going to be plenty of companies that want to buy GPUs from uh, NVIDIA. Mm -hmm, For AI. Yeah. Um, Techno writes him, he says, with Ruben being rushed, do you think the gaming variant of it, whether it's whatever it's called, will also be rushed to early mid-2026 to beat on out AMD RNA 5 only a few months later. No, um, and I said this in the video techno, I took this reader mail to make this clear. Ruben is not gaming. Ruben is Hopper, Volta, not even really Volta, because Volta actually did game okay, actually. Um, So, no, my understanding is that Blackwell's there, it's being accelerated as much as possible, it will have its gaming iterations. And then Ruben will just slap in like Hopper. Kind of like, honestly, uh, Hopper followed Lovelace pretty closely too. So it's they're doing this thing where I think every two years they have a mega architecture that is used for everything. Turing, Ampere, Blackwell. And then in between those, Volta, Hopper, Ruben is the follow-on architecture only for AI because that's where they think the most money will be made right now. And who knows, Mm -hmm. if that were to change, maybe they would just squeeze in a gaming one two years in a row if they thought it was ever worth doing that. I just don't think they think it is right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Falto writes in again. He says, will the next DLSS be Blackwell exclusive or will Lovelace owners benefit from it too? What about the super resolution fourth gen DLSS versus frame gen? They believe they are separate. Um, I can't say I've asked about this, but my suspicion would be Blackwell and Lovelace should be sharing a lot of their stuff. I, I don't I, think I, in gaming, I mean, they've updated some things, but I don't, yeah, I don't, I guess I'm not sure. Um, it wouldn't surprise what, me if there was some new feature, but I don't think there'd be a fundamental, I, we'll see, maybe I'll have a leak out in a week that says the opposite though, but I, I, I think they're going to be more closely related. Yeah, I mean, I just don't see what feature that they could try to jam into uh into the next architecture that i mean into a next version of dlss uh unless yeah i just don't know what it could be because now they already have frame gen like Mm -hmm. unless they like try to do because i've heard this like ai hdr if they try to do something like that and call it that dlss but you know like because of like the better ai capabilities of blackwell it was able to do that in a way lovelace can't but i don't know i don't know (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I feel like they're going to just try to, I mean, I was, I was already directly told that what they're going to be iterating on is what DLSS 3.5 does. So I just think they would do whatever the next thing is, which you know, I've heard is like higher image quality with ray tracing turned on with upscaling mm-hmm. faster with Blackwell. I don't, I don't think it would be a gated feature. Again, though, who knows? Maybe within a month, I'll tell you the opposite. But that's what I believe right well, now. You're speculating right now. Basically. Exactly. And I can't. And again, if you think about Blackwell as something that's kind of like just rushed in with a bunch of new AI capabilities for AI, and it's, I don't, yeah, I, 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 that's what I think right now. Um, anyways, Essie is ready for spring. She's excited to get outside and, well, and start carrying around entire tree branches that she just thinks are S-tier sticks, which really, they can't be that healthy for her, although... I can't imagine they're really any more unhealthy than the typical ramen people are eating on a busy workday. Well, of course, that is 
unless they eat Vite Ramen. This piece of content is brought to you by Vite Ramen. Vite Ramen is a healthy, tasty, and shelf-stable food crafted by an American startup that offers tons of options for eating healthy, like their classic packages that make it easy to add protein and other ingredients of your choice, or also their Ramen Go packages that offer a healthy, microwavable option for those who truly only have a 15-minute lunch break when they are away from home. And you know, I also need to take a second to promote their Nano Boost Vitality Powder as well. Seriously, this is a fantastic alternative to coffee that you'll find me drinking in many Broken Silicon episodes when I'm forced to record late at night, and I truly do believe it blows away their competition. You have to understand, I've been working with the people at Vite for years now, and I have a lot of freedom in what I can promote from their website. And out of the things they make, I have to say, it blows away the competition. This thing tastes great. It's easy to mix into water. You never has that sand-like texture their competitors often have. And so I really cannot recommend that enough in addition to just basically everything on their website. You know, going to their website and buying something from Bite Ramen, that directly supports this channel. And it supports a sponsor that's been good to the Moore's Laws Dead team for many years. So I really do like their products, all of them, especially their ramen and Nano Boost Vitality Powder, and I can't recommend them enough. So support Moore's Law Z by supporting Vite today. All right, let us now shift subjects here to story number three. PlayStation 5 Pro general specs confirmed. PlayStation Spectral Super Les Resolution leaked. A couple of weeks ago, this channel exclusively leaked that Sony was preparing a console with 67 teraflops of FB16, so half that for the normal teraflops number we usually say for gaming, increased bandwidth up to four times ray tracing performance <laughs> higher than the PS5, and 300 tops of Int8 with a new AI-enhanced upscaler included as well, PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution, or PSR. However, what's interesting is that Sony is directly suggesting that they will only have a 45% increase in raw rendering performance, despite having over tripled the teraflops of their predecessor. So what's going on? Well, what you have to remember, first of all, is that teraflops does not ever translate directly to an exact performance increase, or it almost never does, and that the PlayStation 5 Pro still just has 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 over 256-bit bus. Yes, it should be faster GDDR6, but at most, 30% eh, more bandwidth. And bandwidth is always a huge part of any performance equation. Oh, and let us also not forget that the PlayStation 5 Pro will use a derivative of RDNA 3 in later architectures, which means its dual issue is inflating the teraflops number relative to the base PS5. Indeed, a lot of what's been added here seems to be meant to crank up ray tracing, increase frame rates, more so than have a standard everything is better performance increase this time around. Then after all of that, they will use PSSR to make the actual de facto resolution look better. PSSR promises to be easily implementable as a replacement for FSR2, a temporal upscaler with some ML element. Details of its workings have not been shown yet, but we can already tell that PSSR or similar ML upscaler won't work on RDNA 1 through 3. They simply do not have enough ter tops performance to use it in a machine learning heavy technique. To quote Digital Foundry's analysis of all of this, Sony has come up with a very interesting solution to adding new features to older games, which was a problem on the PlayStation 4 Pro. It looks like all games can benefit from PSSR if the developer goes back to them, even if they're on an older SDK. It should be very easy to patch and support for PSSR without having to update to the latest SDK, and this is potentially great. Oh, and FYI, this information has at least allegedly been independently confirmed by Digital Foundry Boundary, Tom Henderson from Intersider Gaming, and other sources as well. So consider this leak entirely bulletproof. All right, this was quite a huge scoop for this channel, Dan. What do you think about the PS5 Pro and PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution? Or Pisser? P or, yes, Pisser, as everyone is going to call it, because I don't think... I'm going to call it Pisser sometimes. It's funny. Unless they, that's just what they use, and now that this leak is out there, like, maybe we shouldn't call it Pisser. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I, I mean, I'm excited to see how it performs. I'm it's not an immediate day one buy to me, but we'll see. Maybe it will be worth getting in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, What I, did you go on? Sorry. Oh, I mean, I, just the performance uplift looks decent, uh, but I, I, it really it, it is vital how good PSSR is for me to want to get it because a 45 percent increase in performance uh, without just without that doesn't necessarily seem 
great to me or are worth upgrading for. Yeah. And, you know, and I've done several PlayStation 5 Pro leaks and analysis videos already this year. And the one thing I've never personally been able to confirm is the exact clock speed of the CPU. But I've always been told it's still Zen 2, just on 4 nanometer now. And that uh, any rumors out there I've seen, no one's suggesting this thing's going to be like 5 gigahertz. So the CPU increase itself isn't going to be that big. It just may be big enough to kind of like make it that little bit easier to hit the target frame rate. Although all tests I've seen seem to suggest 90% of games, the bottleneck isn't the CPU. That uh, You could almost argue the PS5 had a CPU stronger than it really needed to be. I, I mean, I, I think that CPU as it is, what's it clocked at? 4.2 gigahertz or something? No, nah, it's only like 3.4 or something. 3.4, okay. Yeah, 3.4 gigahertz. I mean, yeah, that's probably enough, barely enough to power 100 hertz in most games, but I, th- that is a bit weak for 120 hertz if I'm remembering correctly. So something a bit stronger than that to power to get a, a, up to 120 hertz for most games, I think, is needed. But you don't need Zen uh, 4 in it or something. No. No, and I mean, I, a lot of people said, why would they still be using Zen 2? Um, I don't have the link included, but I, I don't know if it was Digital Foundry or who did an analysis of the dive of the PS5 again recently. And they were like, the version of Zen 2 that AMD is using here takes up like mm-hmm. significantly less die space than the version used on desktop and on top of that it has little things stripped out for better heat dissipation uh that you don't need because you're not doing compute you're running games and they also have other little adjustments inside of it for to the metal backwards compatibility to work in a way that zen 2 cannot do with the ps4 so number one everyone keeps like why would they keep using zen 2 it is because it is a custom version and they don't want to mess with that and then the second one is remember if they don't mess with it and then they go to four nanometer, they can just adjust it for density. And I mean, they could probably get something comparable to like uh, a dense architecture anyways, like in terms of performance per density. It just wouldn't be quite as efficient, be lacking some of the features of Zen 4. They don't think they need those to run games, so. Yeah, and I'm assuming it would go on, it costs a lot more money to go in and re-customize Zen 4 or Zen 3. Probably still be Zen 3 anyways, not Zen 4, for their needs. No, I think they'd use Zen 4. You think? Okay. I, I guess I just don't know how it far It doesn't matter. They're going to use Zen 2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and I mean, you know, and then I've seen people respond to me saying that and go, but why, But they put in all this effort for the GPU. Yeah, they need to. That's the point of a console. So, <laughs> But they're only going to spend as much money as they need to and avoid as many headaches as possible. And that's why they would have done things the way they are. But again, I think it needs to be noted. The CPU will be clocked a bit faster. And please, people, understand this. Every test I've seen done, it's a GPU bottleneck in a game. Like, literally, like, Digital Foundries pulled them up, found ways, and hacked PS5s to test different things. It's, like, almost always the GPU. So I don't think... I do think this will be enough for all those games running at 45 hertz or unstable, now they're locked 60. All those games that are like jumping between 80 to 90, they'll probably be running above 100 hertz most of the time, and it'll feel like a lot better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so then all, all it really comes down to is just how good of a feature PSSR is. Because if it's just as good a, or up there with like DLSS, then yeah, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's what we're going to have to find out here. Um, and I guess to add on to the PSSR thing, the pisser thing, um, to keep on pissing with the pisser, like, what I have heard is this is not just some fork of FSR4, that Sony developed it, they share some of their work with AMD, but this is not a fork of FSR4. Will they have things in common? Maybe, but that's what I think makes this so exciting to see the testing, is it's like, huh, all right, so Sony took the machine learning capabilities of RDNA4, which is what's, there's some of that in the PS5 Pro's architecture, and they, separate from AMD, came up with what they thought would be the best way to do this. And I, it'll be it'll be interesting to actually see someone directly trying to compete with DLSS and possibly FSR4 uh, later this year. That, that'll be really interesting to see who does a better job. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> if, and if Sony does a better job, then... Uh... AMD. Hey, maybe you need to hire some Sony engineers. AMD. <laughs> Please start working with them even closer. AMD. <laughs> if it's comparable to NVIDIA, 
you go, okay, now that's quite surprising. Um, mm-hmm. Trying to think of what, what else there is really to say about this console. You know, again, I just think it's, in, I think some people look at some of the specs and they become confused. It all comes down to this. Why does it have the same amount of RAM? Why does it have an insane amount of teraflops and AI performance, but like it's lacking this other thing? Their goal is to as cheaply as possible, just you don't need to change assets, don't need to change textures, none of that. All you need to do is take this and it should run games now at a locked frame rate completely or maybe even 50% faster. So any game that could have gotten to 120 but didn't now does. And then on top of that, if you use its custom capabilities, you can use PSSR to make games that look like that don't look like 1440p anymore. They look like 4K, and you can just crank up ray tracing. They basically focused on all of the things that wouldn't make devs do work, like <laughs> ray tracing. Turn up the ray tracing. That's it. Um, you know, resolution. Don't worry about adding new asset assets. We just want PSSR to make it look like uh, what is it? Uh, not smoother, but you know, yeah, maybe so there's the, I mean, uh, crisper is the word I'm looking for. They want to make the resolution look crisper and then, you know, higher frame rates. That's it. Mm-hmm. And I think people are underestimating like how much more this may allow them to save costs this time around compared to the PS4 Pro, which really did cost more to make than the base PS4. Not, not crazy oh, yeah. more, but this time, I don't know, honestly, how much more it will cost. Um, Tex Hooper 9 writes in and he says, I'm just wondering if you've heard anything about the size of the PS4 Pro. But doing a smaller node, is there a chance of it being as small as the Slim or smaller? Uh, I mean, this is going to be comparable to like a Navi 48 type product. And the PS5 is comparable to a Navi 22 type product. So their die sizes should be pretty similar. And I could see this even possibly being smaller than the at least base PS5, if not the die shrunk six nanometer one i mean I, I really don't think it's going to be very big and so you're like all right so it's on four nanometer instead of six nanometer but the die isn't that huge i, I don't know at like 20 30 bucks for that uh and it might even use the same <laughs> energy you know or less and there's really nothing else they have to change here i think if they want to make this 500 dollars without a disk drive they can totally do it yeah and then as far as like the console itself goes i don't know they'll probably add like a special distinguishing feature to make it, and it i i would guess it's going to be a bit bigger than like the ps4 the slim ps5 but i would guess that it won't be as i guess they'll the make original. it smaller the ba- i guess they'll make it smaller than the base because the the base ps5 is a bit unwieldy uh, I'll, I'll have to admit that <laughs> yeah yeah i think could it be the same size Maybe, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was in between the size of the Slim and the base PS5. Yeah, I don't know. They'll add another fin to it or something. <laughs> like they ha- how they added another step to the PS4 Pro. Mm-hmm. They'll, a- they'll add yeah. a third fin. <laughs> Please don't. God, it looks so look like a Aquaman device. <laughs> Get like a fin in the middle of it or something. Um, but yeah, I don't know that there's that much else to say here. You know, I guess the only other thing that really comes to mind to bring up here is I have seen that PS5 sales, certainly not as much as the Xbox, but nonetheless have been slowing a bit. I think it would behoove Sony to come out and announce this at $500 without a disk drive um, and then announce the PlayStation 5 Slim, a price drop to $350 even. Like, because yeah. it doesn't come with a disk drive. Like, then it's time, Sony. The PS5 should be 350 and then they can buy a disk drive or not. The PS5 Pro should be 500 or maybe even 450 and they can buy a disk drive or not. It's time to get more aggressive with pricing here. It feels a little ridiculous, actually. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right. I don't know. Did you have like anything else to say about this console? I think we've talked about a couple of die shrinks already anyways. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I just need to see what pisser, how good pisser is. We got to see if this is a wicked piss off for sure. All right. Well, let us then change subjects to something uh, somewhat related or in the same vein of conversation with story number four. AMD announces FSR 3.1. Quoting from Tech Power Up, AMD at GDC 2024 announced the Fidelity FX Super Resolution 3.1. FSR 3.1 adds several image quality improvements to the upscaler itself, improving image quality at every performance preset. Specifically, it improves the temporal stability of the output at rest and in movement. That's a pretty big one. To reduce flickering and shimmering, because that is something I have seen, especially at lower resolutions with 
FSR. It can it can really shimmer there. Or, or the fizziness around objects in motion. It also reduces ghosting and better preserves detail. Key improvements in FSR 3.1 reportedly do not come from better image generation, but a better temporal upscaler aspect. So it is better FSR too. There isn't anything fundamental better here. It's just better. AMD has chosen to showcase this example uh, with Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, a game also chosen by Sony behind the scenes to present PSSR, which is interesting. The image seems much more stable, sharper, with further reduction in ghosting. The key question is, will FSR break through the 1080p usability barrier? Almost since its introduction, when upscaling from 1440p to 4K, FSR 2 remained fairly competitive with DLSS 2, even if the latter typically was perceived better. But once the rendered resolution is further dropped to 1080p, FSR 2 starts to struggle. It is similar in, say, 720p to 1440p. So can FSR2 become competitive once upscaling 1 to 2, or will AMD need to add ML to do so with RDNA 4? We'll just have to find out. But either way, for now, FSR 3.1 further continues AMD's fidelity FX strategy of openness. With FSR 3.1, AMD has decoupled FSR 3.1 frame generation from the upscaling tech itself, which allows FrameGen to work with other upscaling solutions such as DLSS or XE Super Sampling, meaning you could use the quality of DLSS 3 or 3.5, and then if you have Ampere, well, at least now you can get FSR 3.1 frame generation tacked on top of it. AMD surely hopes developers implement 3.1 as their frame gen solution, even if those developers prefer the DLSS upscaling aspect itself. All right, Dan, what do you think about this? Uh, I mean, I think just decoupling uh, FSR and frame gen is a was a good idea. I don't really know why. I don't know why AMD, mm-hmm. both AMD and NVIDIA decided to advertise these as if they are different. They are modifications of their upscaling technology when they're really they're a new feature. That's just a different feature that they. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I think that's good. I think both of them need to get their frame gens, the re- reputation of their frame gen uh, divorce from their reputation of their uh, upscaling features because, frankly, I think the frame gens still have a far more negative reputation than both FSR or DLSS, even though FSR also doesn't have the greatest reputation. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I mean, this looks a lot better, uh, obviously. I, I mean, I-, I would say in a lot of games, even at higher resolutions, once you get to like the performance modes of FSR, it's like, well, maybe just figure out a different way to get your frame rates higher. I mean, there mm-hmm. are games that look really good that do FSR very well, like Call of Duty. Um, what is it? Modern Warfare Two, I think, did FSR very well. We have not played the latest one. Oh yeah, what is that? Which one is that? Is that Modern Warfare Three or yeah, something? Yeah, the one everyone gave horrible reviews. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I thought it worked well on that. I think it works pretty well in Deep Rock Galactic. Like mm, I, I, I just like, have like. Well, I actually I ended up turning it turning it uh, to a higher quality because even at the quality mode, I get like 180 frames per second most of the time in that game now. Uh, but I think uh, the quality mode in most in most games at 4K looks pretty good. But once you're getting to performance mode, uh, it, it can get pretty yeah. pretty bad, <laughs> and they need to improve that a lot. And then at 1080p, like you said, it's basically unusable. So, I mean, I think what they've shown is they. It might be usable at 1080p now, but I, as uh, Tim said in his uh, video, like it remains to be seen if the benefits you get at 1080p will trickle up to the to uh, looking better at like 4K. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, I think the decoupling thing actually might be a really smart move because, um, look, most games are going to have FSR no matter what. Most games are going to have all of the options, XE Super Sampling, FSR, Mm -hmm. and DLSS eventually. But I think decoupling it makes it much more likely that devs insist with NVIDIA FSR is there at launch next to DLSS. Um, Because now they can say, well, look, NVIDIA, we understand you. You're going to help bankroll part of our game and help us implement DLSS. But we're going to have FSR at launch because we want Ampere gamers to be able to use frame generation. And so we're including deal, uh, FSR as well. And I think this is an added component there that's that's really smart for yeah, AMD I to agree. finally do. Um, Deadeyes117 writes in, says, hi guys, frame gen tech as it currently exists can only double the internal frame rate. So if you're running at 115 frames per second on a 120 hertz display with VSync, the game has to slow itself to 60 frames per second and deliver half of the frames via frame gen. I was thinking, would it be possible to instead just complete a slow frame with frame gen to speed them up? 
so portions of frames are interpolated to reduce render time and hit your FPS cap. Maybe this is a new take on the tech that could be used in a similar way to DRS to cover up minor frame drops. Well, this is something me and you have talked about for a while, would be like the holy grail of doing this. Like instead of having to run at 60 de facto, but it looks kind of like 120, what if we could just run at 120 and then every time there's a frame drop, they sneak in some frames? I mean, I'm told... Yeah, this would be the holy grail. This is something AMD and NVIDIA are working on. Having said that, I'm also told this is insanely hard to implement and don't expect it soon. Yeah, or uh, he, uh, Dead Eyes seems to have come up with a different idea for doing the same thing where just on sl- when it slows down and interpolates part of the frame. I, if that mm. could work, I don't know. That might look really weird. Who knows, though? I, I mean, I would love to see something like this be integrated into frame gen because I, I agree that's a fundamental f- flaw of frame gen. Like, and that's why I think like playing because I, 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 while playing with frame gen, I did a lot of artificial frame rate limiting so I could actually experiment and playing at 80 Hertz, uh, without frame gen versus playing at 120 Hertz with frame gen felt, I mean, that felt better to me, uh, without frame gen. Right, like, you're saying I, this is worth pointing out like to run at 144 hertz with frame gen, it's really running at 72 hertz. So you wanted to see even just running 80 native does it feel better and you're like, yeah. Yeah, it feels noticeably better. Uh it, it, there's so I I I I agree like if you're getting anything higher than 60 hertz on a 120 or one or 70 higher than 72 hertz on a 144 hertz monitor. I honestly think it's better to just leave frame gen off. And if you're getting like 60 or something, yeah, maybe it's worth turning on. But if you have, if you're pushing like 90, 100 hertz on your system, I would rather not take the uh, actual internal frame rate hit of going, having to go all the way down from 90 to mm-hmm. 72 or 60 or whatever. Yeah. And I think many have talked about this in detail. I mean, you want to use FSR quality right now. should improve it, though. Already with DLSS, I would say I would rather go from DLSS quality to DLSS balance to keep a locked 120 than use frame gen to get there, too. And it won't have... It'll have its own artifacts, but it's not like frame gen doesn't have them, too. Sometimes just have a dolly picture pop up randomly. Yeah, I mean, and that's... What was the game that they launched? The big game that everybody made fun of that they launched with it? With which one? uh, Frame gen. Oh, for Spoken. Uh, I, I mean, I remember like I uh, when I, I just played around in the demo to see what I liked more, and I, I the performance mode on Forspoken looks pretty bad. I have to admit, uh, but I was getting like three f- fewer frames per second when I just had that on versus when I had Frame Gen on, and it felt so much better just having performance mode. On. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, eventually, some way of sneaking them extra frames would be a huge deal. But I don't think that's easy to do right now. That's going to be quite the thing to solve. But yeah, I think they're obviously looking into that because if they could pull that off, my God, what an accomplishment now. Then I'll leave it on always. Yeah, because the problem with frame gen as it exists right now is it's just it's a feature that you would think would work best for like mid range to low end cards, but it, they're, they're, they want to advertise it for high end cards. Then. It's just not a good feature for high-end cards, how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking about bad high-end things, (laughs) let us move on to story number five. Intel i9-14900KS reviewed and released. Going here from Der Bauer. It is exactly what we expected. The same as what we had with the 12900KS and 13900KS before it. A tiny leap in performance but a huge jump in power consumption, which is typically caused by the exponential relation of clock versus voltage increase here. Depending on the game and scenario, I saw a performance increase of the KS to the K of about 2 to 5%, but I also saw a power consumption increase of 30 to 40%, which is getting just completely out of hand. And then switching just to my write-up. And yep, if you look at Tech Power Up, you can see a less than 2% increase in gaming performance on average and with an absolutely absurdly bad efficiency that is literally often half to a fifth the efficiency of its AMD counterparts with similar or even sometimes better in AMD's case performance. So yeah, in some ways, the KS is a benchmark champion. 
Indeed, Cinebench and other rendering benchmarks are its forte. However, in real rendering, it is often consistently beaten by the 7950X, and in Handbrake, another real app, it also loses. Finally, something that is extra sad is that some reviewers who focus on overclocking saw similar performance and power with the 14900K once they overclocked it to the KS stock. This implies that the KS potentially isn't even better binned than the average 14900K. So what is a buyer paying for with the KS? A limited warranty on delitting? When that delitting is necessity because the only way to cool the KS is direct dye water cooling. <laughs> what did you think of the 14900K, Dan? Surprise, I thought it was really great. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dan just I, I, storms out and like rage argues <laughs> with me about how great it is. It was so cool. I mean, I, I think I, I'm just going to be repeating myself at a certain point, but it's like each time they release a KS, it's dumber than the previous time they released the KS. Like the 9900 KS was decent. I still thought it was kind of dumb at the time, but at least it was a higher bin CPU. And this, they're just overclocking it out of the factory. And so you don't have to do it. That's that's literally what you're getting, I guess. And I guess you're you're allowed to delet it now. So for people that like modifying CPUs, I guess you're it's covered by warranty now. So for the 300 people that want to do that, here it is. <laughs> like it just doesn't do anything. And the fact that they have to push 30 to 40 time percent higher power consumption to get two percent higher performance is nuts. And I I don't understand how this gets released like how a board looks at this and is like yeah this won't make us look dumber than we already look yeah i mean qh freddy writes him he says i feel like people are really beating a dead horse with the way they are comparing the 4900 ks to the 7800 x3d we've already seen this comparison three times already actually first with the 3900 k then the ks and the 4900 k the really interesting thing to me is how stupid the 4900 ks looks compared to the 4900 k and multi-threading they are not that far apart but when you bench them in games somehow the ks is managing to pull 50 to 100 percent more power for less than a three percent performance increase than a cpu of exactly the same architecture and configuration that is what i call impressive um, I mean, I agree with that mostly. I will say, uh, you say w w uh, reviewers are beating a dead horse by constantly comparing it to the 7800X3D because they've already done that three times now. Hey, I Intel, stop presenting reviewers with a dead horse to be beat. Like, yeah, well, they're beating a dead horse, but it's like Intel's like keep saying that horse isn't dead. You need to beat it more. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I don't know what reviewers are supposed to do, not talk about it. I mean, I guess they could say they've released this product four times now. We're not reviewing it. And that might be a stance, but that I, that's all they could really do. Um, you know, I'm just going to ask you this question. Should they have not released this product? Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, it's not even a debate for me. This, this just makes uh, Raptor Lake look bad. Yeah. And remember, I leaked that there was an internal fight over if this should ever come out. I, I I think, you know, I think what they should have done is released it for OEM only with that deleting support, which is meant for OEMs anyways. Mm. There you go. A way for OEMs to try to market their products with a special edition CPU. That's what they should have done. And yeah, just that's called a it a day. I, I mean, especially when you look at the fact that it's like just an overclocked K. I, I mean, that is... It's just terrible. I don't know. QH Freddy writes in again, like he so often does again. Would you bet a 7950X it takes Intel more than five generations for their i9 to match the 7950X and out-of-the-box multi-core efficiency? No, I think Arrow Lake or at a minimum Arrow Lake 2.0 will be more efficient than the 7950X. If not, and certainly Nova like it. And if they're not, there will be a company that's out of business. Yeah, I wouldn't bet Arrow Lake, but you would hope that whatever comes after Arrow Lake is more efficient. Yeah, I, again, you know, we've, again, we've talked about this already, um, but I think Arrow Lake is going to surprise some people with its efficiency. That's my, I'm not 100% sure of that, but if you were to tell me, hey, what's a thing out of left field about Arrow Lake that you think people may be underestimating? I think there's a serious chance it's actually much more efficient than people are expecting. It's just not, 
this insane IPC increase other people are expecting. Mm -hmm. It'll be a big increase in IPC, but not like this 50%. Or I, I honestly don't even know what the fake leakers are saying anymore. Sex uh, acts efficient. <laughs> I, I mean, why not? That'll get clicks before everyone unsubscribes at the end of the year like they always do to that channel. But, um, you know, and actually to get into why I think that too, let me just uh, move on here with story number five. I'm sorry, story number six. All Jesse wants is for Maurice to play with her more often. But unfortunately, he just does not give out playtime or kisses for as low of a rate as she does. And I think she's just going to have to deal with that. But do you know what you don't have to deal with? Paying too much for Microsoft software if you go to cdkeyoffer.com. This piece of content is sponsored by cdkeyoffer.com. Whether it's Microsoft operating systems, Office products, or even many of the latest games, cdkeyoffer.com provides PC gamers with a product this community deserves amongst endlessly elevating component costs. Fair pricing on Microsoft keys is one thing that we at least should get, I think. And, you know, the Moore's Law is Dead team has been working with CDKeyOffer.com for a very long time. And that's because they're good to me, good to Dan, good to about a dozen family members of friends of mine that have used their services. And they've been really, really good, most importantly, to the Moore's Law is Dead team community. So support this channel by using offer code broken silicon to save 25% off Microsoft software or you can also use die shrink to save 3% off everything else on the website like games using either of those codes really helps the channel a ton and it helps save you money. So use those codes broken silicon and die shrink at cdkeyoffer.com today. Arrow Lake pictured and evidence continues to suggest an end of 2024 launch. On the last Broken Silicon, it was let sip by yours truly that qualification samples for Arrow Lake are expected to ship for testing in October. And usually a launch comes one to three months after QS. Therefore, if you think about it, QS in October, a launch is usually one to three months after QS. It's looking fairly unlikely Arrow Lake can effectively launch in volume before November or possibly even before 2024 ends. I later followed up this reporting in a new leak last week where I explained that I think Intel will somehow try to pull off a paper launch in October or November, but I really would not expect high availability of it until 2025 because of that, because it is launching therefore firmly after Zen 5 launches and requires you to buy a new platform. It's really going to have its work cut out for it. But hey, at least you have a picture of what Intel will undoubtedly call Arrow Lake HX from that same video. And yes, I just want to be clear about this. In the video, I don't think I put it on any slides or leaked things that were shared, but I think I may have said out loud Arrow Lake H. Uh, I meant to say Arrow Lake HX, everybody. Although I do have to say this. It seems to be using the same package as Meteor Lake H. And there is a 40 core model coming. So I can't entirely rule out that they won't just say this is a different version of Arrow Lake H. Look at us. We have ch ch chiplets now and we can change what they do. But I do think it's HX and you can see it in the pictures. It seems that the SOC and IOE tiles have been reused for Meteor Lake. It seems like they are pushed out of the way to accommodate a larger CPU tile that has eight big cores and 16 little cores. And it looks like therefore the GPU die was significantly reduced in size compared to Meteor Lake's uh, die to accommodate this. And then there are two dummy dies placed in opposite corners of the layout to fill in these gaps. And so there you go. The die of Arrow Lake's 8 plus 16 configuration leaked by this channel does show Intel's tile strategy bearing some shareability fruit between products. But then what does it say about Intel? If even when reusing some chiplets between products, which have proven working silicon that they don't need to do work on, they still end up launching after the competition due to delays. All right, Dan, what'd you think of Air Lake? Prob hard to launch this year, but we have pictures of at least we'll get a the paper. We'll get paper launch in 2024, and we'll probably actually see a full, an actual launch in 2025. Like I don't know, January hopefully, but. Yeah, in time for laptops, kind of. I don't know. It depends. What you, you would argue you'd want your launches for laptops to actually be in like July November, for back to school or, or something. Yeah, July or November, I would guess, but probably July. But I don't know. I mean, once again, it's hard to be enthusiastic about anything, especially when it from Intel, especially when they're always delayed at this point. I mean, all I can say is this looks expensive to me, and I don't know if that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, and like I said, I, I I wanted to get to this story to expound more upon my point about efficiency. Like if you look at the size of its die, the napkin math 
um, that I saw done by Carbon Crying Carry New Sagata suggested that this has like, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, you know, somewhere between like 100 to 140 millimeter squared of CPU silicon. Yeah, so that's like the same as what Zen 5 will have with two CCDs, if not less. All right, well, they literally call N4P an alter- a cheaper alternative to N3. So if they have less silicon for the CPU portion than AMD is using for Zen 5, but their node is like 10 to 25% better, I don't know that it's really going to be that much stronger. I just think Air Lake's going to probably win single threading. We'll have to see what happens with gaming versus the Vcash variants of Zen 5. And then in multi-threading, AMD's probably going to win, at least in AVX 512 scenarios. Like, in the, It'll just be a mixed bag. AMD wins this, Intel wins some of these things. But it... it, it even if I don't think it's worth the money they're spending to use three nanometer, it is a better node. I think Air Lake may be competitive with AMD in efficiency, but just not okay, be this yeah. like eighty percent. I whatever they're you know they're saying IPC increase. That's kind of what I'm suspecting is going to happen here. I can't promise you they still won't push it harder than they should and still have kind of worse efficiency. But I think QH Freddy, they're they're going to be better in Zen four in efficiency. I think. Uh, I mean, I do to an extent think they kind of have to be because if they're not, if they can't get their efficiency issue under control, even after switching to a completely new architecture, well, then there's just on a way better node. Yeah. On a way better node, then there's just something fundamentally wrong with their design philosophy, which to be fair, it's been the same architecture for four, three generations in a row now, basically. So maybe there was just a power uh, problem with that, uh, everything based off of Alder Lake. But if they can't get that under control with a new architecture, well, then I, I don't see why you wouldn't just dismiss them as not being able to make efficient architectures completely at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, Trogaholic writes him, he says, Hi, Tom and Dan. How will Intel deal with marketing the lack of hyperthreading on its next gen? Even with as many as 40 threads due to having 32 little cores with Arrow, Point, Arrow Lake 2.0, and very strong single-threading performance from the big cores, I see this as something that gamers and tech media will reject of Intel and say they're kind of going backwards. Uh, well, marketing, you're asking two questions. How will reviewers talk about it, and how will Intel market it? Oh, they'll just market the number of cores. They'll say 24 cores and not bring up hyper-threading. That's how they market that. Um, how What will go on with reviewers? Honestly, it just comes down to the performance. Like, if they can, yeah, if they can uh, do mixed and multi-threaded uh, tasks well, st- better than their previous generations, I, I don't see why it would be perceived negatively that it no longer has hyper-threading. Yeah, like if, if in gaming they are competitive with Zen Five, maybe even better, or even you know, and in single-threaded tasks, so not gaming isn't single-threaded, but like single-threading, not Vcash tasks, they beat AMD by like ten percent. And then in mixed threading, maybe they beat AMD by 10%. And then what if there's this surprise where in multi-threading, it's actually still 25% or more better than Raptor Lake. But, you know, maybe in multi-threading, AMD wins by 10 to 20%. I think people will look at that and go, this is a decent architecture. The only way they would hammer it hard is if, like, it doesn't increase multi-threading performance over Raptor Lake. Then they'll go, all right, so you're just trading for these things. And if it does them well, it's still probably worth buying. But it's unfortunate it's not improving this. You could almost argue they would compare it to Comet Lake and Rocket Lake, where Rocket Lake had way better cores, but less of them. And therefore, in some multi-threading tasks, wasn't an improvement over the previous generation. Maybe it'd just be like that, except hopefully this time it's not absurd in power usage. Yeah, because like if they if if Arrow Lake does get the efi- uh, efficiency issue in check, if they have what is, is it APO? If APO is just if, if what we're seeing with APO is just the precursor to finally leveraging all of their little and big yeah. cores perfectly. If everything is APO now, right, is what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think we could have a. This could be a really good gaming architecture. So, I I, I not to fully discount Intel. I'm just permanently pessimistic about anything they make but until they to, change to, to try to be optimistic for a minute it it probably won't be a great multi-threading uh uh cpu but who who knows maybe it will be if it's better than raptor like i don't think it will be seen as a huge negative but productivity people will still pro- probably want to get the 8950x or i don't know if 99, it's what you, not, yeah, there's probably I, or yeah 
Oh yeah, duh, they'll sk- jump to ninety. Yeah, it, it, productivity people will pr- still probably get the ninety nine fifty x over the fifteen nine hundred k if that or whatever they call it. The uh, core nine series two. Fit, <laughs> God, they're naming Intel though. That's something I don't know how they can compete and how silly their names are though. And then for marketing, assuming that the multi-threading is actually decent in uh, in Arrow Lake, for the marketing, they just need to push thre- uh, benchmarks early to show how good at multi-threading it is. Yeah, they won't like say, and we don't have hyper-threading anymore, but don't worry about it. They'll probably just say 24 cores and then in really small letters, parentheses, 24 threads. Um but if they can show good benchmarks, I don't think there will be much discussion other mm-hmm. than despite not having hyper threading, they're advertising better, uh, substantially better multi threading performance. Right. You know, I don't think I don't think it's going to be much to talk about unless there is a reason we have to talk about the multi threading performance. If it works well, who cares how they get there? What if they have two threads, but it has better multi threading? The Raptor, <laughs> like, I don't care how they do it. Yeah. You know, like. And so th- that's what we should hope for, you know, and it kind of makes some sense dropping hyper threading. They're using little cores and big cores. It makes more sense to just focus on making the latency and communication between different core t- types, not have the penalty we've been seeing recently in some scenarios, and then just add more little cores. Otherwise, what's the point of little cores? You know, it is mm-hmm. almost weird. They have hype. They're like three types of threads they have to schedule. They're like, well, this will go to the big core. This will go to the little core. The little cores are busy now. We're start using the big cores again. Like, it makes more sense to just add more little cores at a certain point, as long as they actually are efficiently done. Um, LVAT writes in and says, "How much does the relationship to OEMs drive Intel's decision regarding chipsets and socket support? They always used OEMs to prevent AMD from gaining real market share when they lag behind. They already lost the do-it-yourself market, but still own OEMs. It seems like, which like a new version on the spec sheet each year, even if it is the exact same product. For me, things like 11th, 14th, and new sockets every other generation makes sense to keep OEMs stepping close to Intel. Now, so I, I think it's a mixed bag." Um, because I've heard of, there were some OEMs that basically skipped Rocket Lake, right? Mm -hmm. And I've heard a lot of OEMs are basically skipping 14th gen. Um, yeah, some products will use it, but like the bulk of their laptops are still going to use 13th gen, Hawk Point, or some Meteor Lake. And so I just think it's worth pointing out that OEMs don't always like the new gen, uh, actually. They, they expect they just, some modicum of improvement. They often do, but not always. Yeah, they they just like being able to advertise a new gen whenever they can because I don't actually know they how like, much. But it, they don't always do it if they think it's a stupid generation. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think a lot of them have skipped some of the particularly stupid generations. So right. So I don't. I, I is our OEMs making Intel do this? No, uh, Intel is deciding to do this. Is mm-hmm. my answer pretty firmly actually. Um, da, 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 and, 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 you know, with regards to controlling OEMs, yeah, I mean, look, De- Intel pretty much owns Dell, but like Lenovo is clearly using AMD more and more. I've already leaked details about multiple OEMs wanting to use AMD more. So I, I think that ship has sailed and they are going to use AMD if they want to most of the time, unless they're Dell, of course. All right. Let us then move on to the wrap up. So these are. All of the uh, remaining stories that I thought we had to discuss, but I didn't think deserved their own like 10 to 20 minute conversation. Um, All right. So the first one here is by, so this is actually kind of a big deal. Um, This tiny corp pauses development of AMD Radeon GPU based tiny box AI clusters. Uh, This has been a ton of bad PR for AMD with them constantly complaining about the capabilities of their chips. And I've heard some people say they're just trying to like beat AMD over the head before AMD takes market share to get their act together. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I don't have much to say here except that clearly AMD still has some work to do. I don't hear this from everybody. Not everybody talks like this company though. A lot of them like the strides AMD is making with their software and hardware. What we saw Jim Keller and Raja Kadori Say for their company, they're just done. They're buying 7,900 XDXs. They think they're good for their uses. Um, but I think at a minimum, this shows that AMD has some ground to take, right? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a... <laughs> this is definitely by Tiny Corp a, uh, hey, get your shit together uh, post. <laughs> because yeah. they, I guess they can't sell any of their crap anymore. So that's not um, good. Or their AMD stuff, I should say. 
Um, also, more direct funding to Intel, supposedly, from the Biden administration with the CHIPS Act. It was weird because, like, the Pentagon basically said, we don't want to fund Intel, but I guess, I don't know. I, I think when it comes to all this CHIPS Act stuff, one thing I need to remind everybody is, at least from the people I've talked to in the past month, Intel really isn't getting much money right now. Like, they can announce whatever they want, but until the check's there and cleared, Intel is still cash-strapped. And there is probably an incentive of uh, by the uh, U.S. government to keep Intel afloat because of all of the jobs and fabs uh, mm-hmm. they have. Like the the U.S., there is a problem with the U.S. that the, it, it has fallen behind pretty drastically compared to other countries when it comes to or well, compared it, to TSMC. It, it, it's running the risk of falling very behind uh, at our node processes. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, Hynix shows off three gigabyte. GDDR7 for what, 2026? I just think this is interesting. Uh, Hynix showed off um, a bunch of planned... Let me see here. I'm trying to scroll down here in the article. Like they said, like up to 40 gigabit per second, you know, up to 24 gigabit capacities for the chips. Uh, but they, I don't see any label here of like when the higher capacities and stuff are coming out. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. They say they're going to get to being able with the highest capacity here. That would suggest on a 128-bit bus, you could have, what would that be? Uh, I, I mean, I think at least 16 gigabytes, if not more. I mean, that'd be great. It's just it doesn't seem like there's any timeline for this happening. It just still feels like we may be stuck with some VRAM constraints in the low end and ultra high end for the time being with GDDR7. Mm-hmm. Um, also, this was a controversy with the... 7900 GRE launch, the limited overclocking. I guess AMD just updated it so that you could overclock it far more. And scrolling down here and looking at what Tech Power Up was able to achieve, it was another, it was like another 5% or almost another 10% over what the base was. They were, yeah, so now that the overclocking um, is unlocked by AMD, it looks like you can clock this to within 10% if not within 5% of a base 7900 XT. Now, keep in mind, you can still overclock the 7900 XT even more, but it does seem like overclock to overclock if you're going to use this feature now for sure. The 7900 GRE is something to consider for price performance if you're someone who's willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, All right, here we have a couple reviews of MSI's Claw showing Meteor Lake is not even remotely competitive (laughs) with... uh, any, 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 honestly, AMD handhelds. I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts about the MSI Claw. Uh, it confuses me a little bit why MSI decided to go with that for their the, their new handheld. Or it, maybe they just bought up some Meteor Lake and they're like, well, I guess we have to put it in something. <laughs> but yeah, it seems both worse than the Ally and Steam Deck in every way conceivable, which is quite a quite an accomplishment. Yeah, I guess I'm basically forced to say this now. I wasn't sure if I was going to say this to be part of a bigger leak. Um, but I, I Dan, I, I'm basically told that MSI got their Meteor like chips for free if they put them in the claw. That like Intel oh, bought this because they were like AMDs in the Steam Deck, the ROG Ally, GP. I mean, everything is just popping up in everything now. And this wasn't always cl- true. There were like Tiger like handhelds that were competitive with AMD. Um, and Intel was like, we got to have a gaming handheld or it looks like we're not. And then also they know NVIDIA is about to have a switch too. So Intel's like, we got to have a gaming handheld or we will look stupid. Uh, and, and, and I'm told that MSI was, was basically given these for free or at a significantly reduced cost if they went in the MSI claw, like Intel bankrolled this so they could argue they had their own handheld. And it, okay. it's, it's, it's a, it's a disaster. I mean, what do you want me to say? This thing is like. Worse than a Rembrandt handheld. It's terrible. It, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I mean, once again, it's one of those things from Intel where it's like, I know you want to be able to have, like, have your advertising thing, like you have this and this, but at a certain point, does it not make you look worse if, yes, you have a handheld on the market, but it's also the worst handheld on the market, like by a full pretty of wide bugs. Market inefficient just wait for lunar lake which i hear could be an excellent handheld architecture yeah um this actually popped up uh at the last minute here but also there was something here posted by yukians who i consider a pretty reliable leaker 
uh, or at least share of leaks as well. And it's, I've actually seen documents that look like this before, Dan. Uh, I think I may have leaked stuff that was based on one that kind of, I know what type of document this person has access to. I've seen it before for previous oh, generations. Yeah, yeah. I, um, and yeah, it seems to confirm that at its peaks, some Zen 5 products are clocked a little faster than their Zen 4 competitors. But most of them seem to be clocked a little lower. So again, I think the average mm. for clock speed for Zen 5 products in consumer is going to be the same or slightly lower than Zen 4. But then the best models may hit like six gigahertz or 5.8 or something. You know, that, that's basically yeah, what it I, looks like to me. And, I, and once again, uh, like, I really don't care if some uh, metric that we use to measure performance by is lower if the performance you get is better. So <laughs> whatever. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, well, let's wait for reviews. This doesn't mean Zen 5 is bad. But again, I need to continue to say this to people. I do not see the evidence that Zen 5 is some 40% performance increase or something. Uh, mm. With AVX 512 and multi-threading, maybe. But like, I don't think that's what the single threading is going to be. Um, and, you know, this really doesn't need much discussion, but AMD finally confirmed RDNA 3 Plus and uh, a few features about Strix that this channel has leaked for like a year, mm -hmm. including that it's coming out this year. So I just think that's worth also bringing up is like, honestly, there's nothing new to say here, but Strix uses Zen 5. It has the AI engine around where we said it would be. And it's launching this year with RDNA 3 plus. Now it's not a rumor. It's just true. <laughs> yep. Confirming more leaks from Moore's Law is dead. Um, all right. Well, let us move then to the final reader mails on this episode. If I can write down the timestamp <laughs> correctly, <laughs> well, I slowly stall to write that um, bam, down bam. here. <laughs> Beefish36 writes in and says, you alluded to this in the talk with Tim, but do you think Strix Halo missed its window to be impressive? 4070 performance at the high end when that will be likely Blackwell 60 class doesn't say premium to me. Well, doesn't it? If they're selling the 50, 60, and $3,000 laptops, don't hold, hold your breath too hard. Even if it will have high multi-core performance, I could see a regular Strix plus Blackwell combo being just as power efficient, but much stronger at the high end. Well, it's also easier to cool, has access to more memory. That 5060 is probably going to have what? 12 gigabytes at most in a laptop, if we're lucky from what it sounds like. Okay, well, what if a Strix Halo laptop has unified 128 gigabytes? Yeah. Like, that's that's a yeah, sign. But, I, but what do you think about the question? I mean, I mean, I obviously, like, any t if something could have come out earlier, it's obviously going to look more impressive against what exists at the time. But I think an APU that gives you, uh, what do we even call the 60? That I guess they still want you to say it's mid-range performance. It's, or it's upper low end, I would say. Yeah, it, upper low end performance on a laptop APU is still pretty impressive to me because you're going to be able to play pr any game pretty damn easily. And that would have been true whether the 5060 is out or not. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I think Strix Halo, if they keep making Halo uh, APUs after that, they're going to continue to look more impressive against the the discrete gpus that exist at the time and even the 60 like the 60s class uh, gpu is typically a pretty high volume uh gpu i would think in the laptop market so if they can rival that with an apu that's a pretty damn big deal yeah i think that this it all comes down to the you know efficiency performance but also pricing less so than being worried about if this can still be impressive i just think amd won't be able to command as much of a premium like so they said 4070 laptop performance, in decent 4070, like maybe 90 watt 4070 laptop performance. What does that mean? Uh, that means like kind of almost 3070, you know, like 4060 Ti, 30, like somewhere around there, like as strong as a PS5, but in an APU. That's that's still enough, I think. It's just now they're going to have to compare it to the 5060 so they can't as easily say this laptop should cost two grand yeah. unless it comes with a ton of RAM for professional uses. But outside of that, I still think you're going to have scenarios where it's more efficient. Remember, at a minimum now, it doesn't take up as much space on the motherboard. It's easier to cool, so it should be easier to sell it for a lower price. So, you know, it still seems premium to me if they can sell it in a $1,500 laptop that's 
as efficient, if not more efficient, depending on certainly in gaming usage, you'll probably be more efficient than NVIDIA. Um, and they can also say, Hey, you know, you don't have any of the VRAM constraints. It has a ton of cores. I, I, I still think it's, I still think it can be impressive. It's just, they're going to have to market it maybe a little differently. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Jensen Wang, great leader CEO. So you changed mm. his name slightly. Was Intel doing better with GPUs in their CES presentation of their iGP running F1 2011 and 2012 or today with a, G, a dedicated GPU coming out late, power hungry, area efficient, and selling at a loss? I mean, to get to the real question I think you're asking, Jensen, I think Ivy Bridge was, uh, uh, I guess, well, th- would this have been Sandy Bridge, though? Back then, I don't know. No, it is Ivy Bridge. It says in the title. Yeah, I think Ivy Bridge was legitimately impressive. And I think I want to highlight this question because I think I've seen way too many takes about Alchemist that are like, well, nobody's ever bought Intel for their graphics. Yes, they have. Ivy Bridge laptops uh, were able to, I mean, I remember this, Bioshock Infinite one of its minimum requirements was HD 4000 graphics. And you could play the game, I believe, as well, if not a little better than the PS3 could, which, yeah, PS3 and 360 were long in the tooth, blah, blah, blah. But that was as good or better than stuff AMD was doing in performance per watt. And the drivers worked fine. You remember, like, they worked fine. Intel integrated graphics drivers worked totally fine until, I don't know, after Skylake. Something just changed with Tiger Lake and onwards with their drivers. And so to answer your question, I think Intel graphics were more impressive for their time in 2012 than now. Yeah, I mean, they weren't trying to advertise themselves as a thing that you would game on regularly, but they were like, yeah, you can play games on this. And at the time, that was true. Now, I guess they have more fully featured uh, graphics cards, if you want to call them that, but... They're inefficient and uh, <laughs> they're in- inefficient and they're pretending that they're better than they really are. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, 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 Intel was not always uncompetitive in graphics. Broadwell was amazing and beat well, AMD. Yeah, Intel was wasn't always there, bad. Yeah, and there was a, there were periods where their integrated was just better than AMD's, if I'm remembering correctly. Or I don't know if it's that simple. Or if it was barely worse, but the big problem the was CPU was just so much better. And it was well, more the, efficient. The, well, the, the thing is, though, the, the, th- the problem with it was, though, was the graphics got worse as you went lower. And AMD had the reverse approach where their APUs, uh, the iGPU was stronger on their, like, uh, was strong on, like, their low-end APUs. So you could actually get something with a I- decent iGPU for a really low price. Um, yes and no, but it would be easier to get one in a cheaper device. Yeah, they did have low a, end ones with more disabled it. stuff, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, Carbon Cry writes in. He says, since Hell Divers proved a live service game can be great and greatly enhanced by being a live service, when should we expect more articles, social media posts, and videos of true gamers bitching about how live services are inherently wrong, morally evil, and always making games worse? Oh, I don't know. I think people are. I, I think we're. I think they're always going to find things to complain about here. But I, I think he has a point of like, well, live service isn't always bad. It's just bad when they shoehorn a non-live service game into being when, live service by nickeling and diming you. When they make a game live service that didn't start as live service, it always sucks. Like what Call of Duty did where they at one point there was a Call of Duty game. I, I think it was like Black Ops, one of the a million Black Ops games, if I'm remembering correctly. Three had, or four, I believe it was. Yeah. It, had like multiple different types of live service things integrated into it, if I'm remembering correctly. So there were like loot boxes, uh, uh, season passes, and like, uh, uh, what's it called? Like uh, the premium mode. So there was like, they were trying to get you to pay for things in like two or three different ways. Whereas with Helldivers, it was conceived of as a live service game. And uh, there's really not much nickel and diming in that game. Like, you can pay to get things quicker or buy them, but you also unlock them at a regular rate, which is also what Battlefield was doing for a while, where they're like, yeah, you can unlock everything, but if you want to get everything in the assault class because you're busy, you can pay us for it. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and But and it's not a better weapon. It's just more customization. Yeah, and that's the same way that Helldivers works as far as I know. Like, you can't buy, like, the things that you buy weapons with, but you can, like, the metals or whatever they're called. Uh, but I've only played the game probably, like, the in-game thing says I've spent, like, 13 hours or something in missions so far. So us dicking around in the menu, that's probably about 18 or 19 hours. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm already able to buy, almost able to buy half of the uh, the thing that you can unlock by paying $20. So it's not that Super bad. credits or something, I think yeah, it's called. I, yeah, we yeah. already have enough super credits to buy, to get half of the, the $20 thing that you can buy anyways. So no. it's, it's, it's fine. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that was, yeah, they conceived of it as a live service game. So it doesn't suck. <laughs> yeah. Right. And they conceived of it in a way that it wouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. It is. You're right. It's, it's always the games where they're like, you need to make this live service. And what they're really saying is you need to nickel and dime the shit out of this. Not, oh, well, this is how we will make extra money. And it's built this way from the start. So we're going to make sure it's not annoying from the start. Yeah. Um, you know, this wasn't the worst one like Battlefront 2. Isn't that just like an insane pay to win? Well, that, where that people was so, discovered that, like, I think they, they fixed it that later. It was so but, bad that they removed it, basically. Yeah, like they were like, you had to play like a thousand hours to even unlock half the stuff. It was ridiculous. Yeah, it, it was so pay to win that, like, like I, I think you could like literally pay to have your ship do 20% more damage or something. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was a thing. I remember like, that. That's, that's nuts. Uh, all right, well, I, that's all we have to discuss on this episode of Broken Silk, kind of br- briefer than usual, but I'm fine with that if you guys are. Um, any final I mean, things you want to talk about, Dan? I mean, we can just do random babbling for the next 30 minutes to get it up to the normal length if people want, but... I, I, I think I think we'll just stop now. That's what okay. I'm going to say. Okay. Um, what if we did do that, though? What if we just sat here? Because I have noticed, like, because you'll see people in the comments that go, Oh, why do these have to be so long? And it's like, for, there's timestamps. And number two, uh, or, or, the, or even I'll put it this way. They'll phrase it this way. If you made these shorter, they'd be so much more successful. Wrong. My most successful episodes are on average the longer ones. So, Dan, what if, what if what we did is just babbled for two hours or like I walked out of here and like turned on Spotify music or something like I was just, <laughs> just watching me cook just so that when people saw the subjects, FSR three, Blackwell, Arrow Lake, and then a three hour runtime, they're like, oh yeah, three hours of those subjects. I got to click even sooner. And then they're like, you talked for an hour and a half and then cooked. And then you, you talked for an hour and a half and then you played, are you talking? Uh, whatever there, Springsteen. Are you bringing Springsteen on my bean? For you talking you two to me like yeah, the are Scott you, are Ackerman, you watching- Adam Scott show <laughs> where they truly waste time in a way that perplexes some people. I've heard listen to it. Yeah, just put an episode of you talking you two to me after that. Mm-hmm. We're like we like this show. You should listen to this. <laughs> you just take the, the latest episode of that and one time something exit. To make it fit to the three hour mark. So, yes. well, we only had to fill an hour this episode. So now it's at four times speed. That, <laughs> were, that would not annoy anybody, I'm sure. Um, no. And I'm sure Scott Ackerman and Adam Scott would love that if they fig- found out that we were doing that. They might just be more confused than Matt, <laughs> like what the game plan is here. Yes. Um, but True. we do like that podcast. We can't, uh, what is it, uh, recommend it enough. Apparently, I can't talk enough. So, or talk mm-hmm. well enough. Case in point, I screwed up saying talk well enough. So I think it's time to stop it, though. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like the video, comment for the algorithm, share it. Sharing it helps a ton. But then also make sure you subscribe to the Moore's Law is Dead uh, YouTube channel and ring that bell button. And then, of course, subscribe to the podcast, your podcast app of choice, and give us a review. And, of course, the best way to support us is join the Patreon. We just had another one come out now, quantifying the performance and specs and features we want out of Blackwell and RDNA 4. Then before that, we had a whole hour-long episode about LGA 1851. These never have ads. There's a back catalog of hundreds of pieces of content. Many of them are very evergreen, too. Like, they don't require you to, like... They're about concepts, past things... Like, so that it's worth going back and listening to them. 
I mean, there's a whole like, I think, what is it over an hour discussion or something about like what it's like, how we get this information sometimes that's out mm-hmm. there. So, and there's, and there's some episodes where there's interviews with guests, there's die shrinks that are that. So, you know, if you like any of this content, there's so much more of it for there. If you just join us for $2 a month and the most popular tier is $4, it gives you even more content and features. So please join us there uh, or support our sponsors. And otherwise, everybody, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Have a good week. Bye. This podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, it's not just me. Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, renders being done by the industrial designer Jean-Philippe Clermont, and special assistance is also provided by Carmen Cry and Carrie Nosugad as well. Find all of our information at www.moreslawisdead.com on the about slash support page in the event you do want to hire me for consulting work, hire Gerard for audio work, hire Jean-Philippe for industrial design work, or you're interested in working with Carbon Cry or Kerry No Sugata as well. You can also find our long-term sponsors on that page if you want to show them some love for putting food on our tables. Or you can also mail us some love. You can send letters or hardware donations to the following address. Moore's Law is Dead, P.O. Box 60632 in Nashville, Tennessee, zip code 37206. Although, to be honest, the best way to show Moore's Law is Dead some love is to support us on Patreon. Patrons are what makes Moore's Law is Dead content truly possible. Every month and really every day, depending on who you're talking about, me, Gerard, Dan, and John philippe are working tirelessly to provide a steady stream of content that we could not keep doing unless we knew the work was possible without being reliant on sponsors dictating every little thing we put out. Don't get us wrong. We love our sponsors, but we love directly working for you, our fans, much more. If you have any extra money, even a couple free dollars a month, consider supporting us directly on Patreon. Those couple of monthly dollars will get you access to the exclusive podcast Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to ask guests questions, and of course, access to the Moore's Laws Dead Discord full of like-minded people who I am sure would love to meet you. I am one of them. Additionally, higher tiers get access to early, ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the ability to ask questions in all Broken Silicon episodes and loose ends live streams ahead of the recording, and the entire back catalog of Moore's Law is Dead podcasts, in addition to having thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts depending on the tier with other perks available as well. And hey... If you cannot afford to support us directly every month, please do share Moore's Law is Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family and on social media and websites like Reddit. And give Broken Silicon a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast app of choice. All of this does really help us so much. But like I said, this podcast would not be possible without it. the patrons directly providing predictable and reliable support every month. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher supported levels. Brad Medlin, Drita Foles, Z Jits, Daniel D, Aaron Close, Jan Rano, Daniel High, Jay Z Ziggy, Deke, Nicholas Buckner, MJB1, SNES Chalmers, Jam Ferriera, Hardforum.com, Valcom Alev, Jensen Wang, Gregorius Acker, Sarcastro, Evan Dingle, Andrew S, Chris Rich, Compressed Earthblocks, 3DS Boy 08, Halbuma, Shredbird, Greg Wanchek, Holden Mobley, Benjamin Cannon, Jonathan, Sammy Malas, Blake, Franco Frederick, Jordan Simkovic, Toka, Julian Leak, Jake223, The Boss Haas, Jake Martin, Zicky, Stephen Hart, Meat and Pork, Tim Robb, Ian Clifford, Travis Gooding, Stefan, Grizzant, Mads, Sutu Taylor, Stephen Coates, Michael McGee, Greg, Patty Cakes, Amiable Chief, Tommy, Mark Mitchell, and Ethra Zink, I Should, Mark Raidmaker, James Anderson, Gold Addict, Judson N, Cameron, Wesley Sacher, Henry Shane, Michelle Pell, D31337 Antics, Hexapuma, Reginald Ari, T. Cottom, Game and Since Reagan, Jeff Settler, Loophole 35, Jamie Witters, JSMMH, Winstar, James I. Raider. Corey Leonard, Little Jeremy, Shay, Milton, Pulse Media, Melodic Warrior, Dave Schultz, Mac Taffy, Stephen Dick, Chuck Glennon, Brett Jones, Austin Haggerty, Justin Bustle, I-70-11700K. 
Joe Foot, My Sharona, Earth Taurus, Hardland, Slushbaugh, Jansen Angima, Joseph Kelly, Samuel Park, Win Wang, Him Sagung, Tails 2299, Mio Val, Vega, John Sisypho 7771, Charles Russell, The Forbidden Juice, Arby Racer, AC, Bright Wright, Michael Cozy, Dr. J Mad, Alex Vega, 3D, John Swin, Jolan Martina, Kikum, Elbergun, Solarize 80, Matthew Milo, Hudat 42, Penton Winta, Rowan McKicky, Cornster 671, Sprutnik, Jeffrey Gentleman, Angel of Cake, Omega Doge, Roger Repser, Ian, Paul Castro, and of course, thank you to Sahara for the music. <laughs>